Good morning up there, church. It's a little cool, and uh, things are completely different than what they were the other day. But isn't that just exactly like life? <laughs> you don't necessarily always know what to expect. And we have in our minds sometimes and our ideas that things are going to go a, a certain way. And I'm often guilty of that. Uh, I've always... In school, I always did really well at math because no matter how you do it, 2 plus 2 equals 4, no matter what. And so, we're also, we also find ourselves doing that same thing in all other areas of our life. And in particular, when it comes to uh, the things of God. And maybe you're like me, you're thinking, you know, we're going to set out a path, uh, we're going to get in church, we're going to pray, uh, we're going to read our Bibles, we're going to quote, you know, Bible verses, and we're going to do this. And because we're following God and this is the path that we're on, that that's going to equal uh, a easier road. Sometimes we get in our minds that as long as we're following God, we're always going to have uh, peace, we're always going to be at peace with each other, we're all, things are always going to go in our favor. And then when it doesn't, we kind of start questioning, wait a minute God, I thought you was on my side. Uh, wait a minute God, I thought that you had my back here. Uh, wait a minute God, what, what's going on here? And then we can start pointing fingers and, and blaming God. And this is, often, this is often what I'm guilty of. I mean, do you find yourself sometimes in this position like, God, what happened here because we're, we're we're praying, we're doing everything right, we're, and then yet trouble finds you. Do you ever find that way that you're trying to do everything right, but still yet, trouble finds you? Hard decisions find you. A, a hard life finds you. And doing everything right. Doing everything right. I know of many people that uh, take care of their bodies and they, they bodybuild, they diet, they exercise, and then they still get heart disease. And then they start questioning, like, God, well, happy, I was doing everything right. I was doing everything right. And sometimes we fall into that. We fall into that. You know, I think just because we're following God, just because we're in, and we're in a series, follow me. Because we're talking about Jesus gave us one thing to do, and that was to follow him. And here we are, we're on this journey to follow him. But yet, trouble finds us. And so my question to you is, even though you're following rules, even though you're following God, even though you're on this path, when trouble finds you, does that mean that God brought that calamity on you? See, sometimes trouble finds us whether we're following God or not. It's just that whenever we're following Him, we have peace through the storm versus no peace. If you have your Bibles, this is what we're going to look at today, and this is in Acts chapter 5. Because just because you're following Jesus, just because you are going to church, just because you're reading your Bible, just because you're praying, just because you're trying to live a moral life, does not mean that you'll be without trouble. It doesn't mean you'll be without issues. It doesn't mean that it's going to be an easy life. For there's nothing, uh, there's nothing easy about it. We have challenging experiences. We have difficult people. We may have difficult uh, jobs or difficult bosses. Um, in Acts chapter 5, it says, But a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphirah, sold a piece of property. However, he kept back part of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge and brought a portion of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. If you read the last verse of Acts chapter 4, it says they were all taking care of each other's need. They were selling property and they were distributing as there was needs. And now here in Acts chapter 5, we're introduced to this couple. And they wasn't forced, they wasn't asked to, but they sold a piece of property. They kept some of it, which was not wrong, but they gave off the impression that they gave it all. And so they lied. They lied 
to the disciples. They were justifying their actions and they lied to the disciples and they came and they brought to the feet. And this is what happened. Verse 3, Then Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds from the field? Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? And after it sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So the, this lying has taken place because they're giving off the impression of one thing, but did something else. So I don't want you to understand it was their doing. And then you get to verse 5. When he heard these words, Ananias dropped dead. And a great fear came all who heard. The young man got up, wrapped his body, carried him out, and buried him. So here's this man, Ananias, who did this sinful act of lying, had a piece of property, him and his wife, they sold it, they kept a portion back, gave it to the disciples, said, here, we sold this land for such and such amount, we gave it all. But they didn't. They kept a portion of it back. And when Peter was confronting him about this, and if you look at the language that was used, why have you allowed Satan to feel your heart? This lie. This deceitful plan. So they kept a portion of it back. And when as Peter was confronting him, and when he confronted him about this, first this is very powerful. When he was confronted about this, when he heard these words, he dropped dead. He dropped dead dead his actions brought upon his death his choices brought upon his death now look at verse 7 there was an interval of about three hours then his wife came in not knowing what had happened Tell me, Peter asked her, did you sell the field for this price? Yes, she said, for that price. And so what's setting up here is that Peter's confronting her. She had the opportunity to come clean. She had the opportunity to set it straight. Here's what happened. But instead, look at verse 9. Then Peter said to her, why did you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Instantly, she dropped dead at his feet. When the young man came in, they found her dead, carried her out, buried her beside her husband. Is this not the craziest story? <laughs> it seems so obscure, doesn't it? She had an opportunity to do the same thing, but instead, she did the same thing as her husband. Two people three hours apart from each other, both conceive this evil plan to deceive the disciples, to lie to God. And in their lie, in their actions, when they were confronted, they both dropped dead. Now here's my question. At what cause was this couple's death? What brought calamity upon this couple now before you answer i want you to think very carefully because many times in our life we will make choices and blame god for the results oftentimes we will marry someone and then we'll start questioning god why did you allow me to marry them we will purchase things and then find ourselves in debt and they're like god what why, do you, why did you do this? Why did you allow this? But we're the ones who made the decisions. So I ask you again, what brought calamity upon this couple? Well, we could say, I think pretty safely, it was their choices. So church, what about in your life? Does some of the trouble that finds you, is it, a result of the decisions that you have made. And see, 
Many times we're, we're pointing the fingers and blaming God. Oh God, why this? Oh God, what, what are you doing here? Oh God. But yet we are making bad choices. We're making bad choices. And so here we see this couple and what they did. And they are lying, deceiving, and confronted. They had the opportunity to come clean, but instead they continue to lie about it and dropped dead. Now, I'm not saying that if you go out here and tell a lie that you will drop dead, but there are consequences for your actions. There's always consequences for our actions. There's always going to be some result. And some is going to be in our favor and some are not going to be in our favor. But we have a choice to make. Parents, this is not what you teach your kids. You have a choice to make. You obey me, things go well for you. If you disobey me, well, things are not going to go well for you. And so there's, there's results for that because there's always responsibility. There's accountability. And I think that's the part that we often struggle with. We want to make choices without any accountability. We want to spend money any way we want to without ever having to pay for it. Without ever having to pay for it. I thought I got free money one time. Uh, Mom wanted to teach me uh, responsibility. So I was 18. She said, uh, let's get you a credit card. And I had a $200 limit. I went, okay, credit card. It was a Capital One credit card. And so I've got this, and at the same time, uh, I had recently purchased a vehicle, and so I was making that payment, and I got this credit card. And I thought, oh, I went and got gas at Big Break Exxon, and I paid for it, and I still had all my money in my pocket. I just put it on the credit card. It was great. It was great. The next time, I, I'm going to do the same thing. So I stuck it in there, and I paid for it. This kept going on. And then I noticed at the end of the month, I never got a bill somebody's messed up and I have free money. It is great. So this went on for another two weeks. I kept using that. Remember I had a $200 limit. Well, in the fine print, they tell you that there's such thing as overdraft on your credit card. So I got charged for that. This, some lady called me up and was like, William Johnson, yes, uh, we've noticed your Capital One credit card. You haven't made any payment. Oh, I didn't know it's because I've not gotten a bill. She said, yes. However, you still know you have to pay that back. And I said, well, I can't pay it back if I don't have a bill. Long story short, I had $300 in charges for $200 worth of gas. Now, who was at fault? Well, I'm the one who charged it. And sometimes we make choices, we make decisions, and the first thing that we'll do is we'll start looking to somebody else we can blame. Oh, it was my mom's fault. She got me the credit card. As a matter of fact, I didn't even tell her about it. I just paid it. I didn't like it. I didn't want to, but I just paid it. But how often do we make decisions like this and we're looking for somebody else to blame? How many times have you gotten in trouble or found yourself in a situation and you went to blame someone? siblings are the worst for this especially growing up it wasn't me it was his fault it wasn't me it was their fault i didn't put that there they put it up and i would get so angry because my dad would tell us to pick something up like yeah dad but that I, that wasn't me that was uh that was john he went i didn't ask whose it was i just told you to pick it up and so i had to do i was getting consequences for his actions and then he also got some of mine the whole point of it is church what i really want you to understand with this story is is that there are consequences for our actions and sometimes we have nowhere else to blame but where ourselves church and i know this doesn't feel good and i know that we don't like that but this is the 100 percent true we make decisions and we live with the results we make decisions and then we live with the results what do you think about ananias and sapphira here they had a choice here. And what were they led by? They were led by themselves. We're in this series, follow me. Okay, we're in this series, follow me. Who were they following? Were they following Jesus? No, they were following themselves. And so as they were following themselves, they were missed, they were a part of the community. 
They knew the disciples' name. They were a part of the believers. So even though they were doing everything else right, they made a decision outside of that realm, outside of following Jesus. They didn't consult Jesus on this idea. They didn't sell their property and go, hey, God, uh, we're, we, we've, got, we've come into some money here. What should we do about it? They didn't consult God. They didn't go up to Peter and say, hey, what should we do here? They made this, they conjured it all up themselves. And what did they do? They ended up dropping dead. Dropping dead. So they were, even though they were a part of the community of God, even though they were a part of the church at that time, they made a decision and they had to live with the results. Now church, during this time, the church was booming. I mean, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit leading them. I mean, the church was growing leaps and bounds in just a short period of time. It grew to 8,000 people. I mean, it, it really, really grew. And what the, they needed is they needed some help. They needed some help. And so they were looking for some, the disciples were looking for some people to come forward that they could really, really help. And so if you'll look in Acts chapter 6, because you see here there's something different that happened. So in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, they were looking for help, and it says the proposal pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. We just sang about him just a minute ago. We just sang about him. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. What was he full of? He was full of faith and the Holy Spirit. He was full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And they also chose Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And I love this, verse 6. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So they chose these people that went through an approval process. One, we get a little bit more description out of. He was full of faith in the Holy Spirit. They're sitting before the disciples, and here they are. They get their approval, they lay their hands on them, and then they're sent out. So the Holy Spirit is leading this work. The Holy Spirit is one who's leading them. Who is it that is leading you? Right now, who is it that is leading you? Every time we allow ourselves to be the Lord of our life, we will find trouble before we can even think of it. Whenever we allow ourselves to be our guide, so they're allowing the Holy Spirit to do the guidance here. They're leading them. They're guiding them. They prayed over them. They laid their hands on them. And immediately here, we see Stephen goes to work. Look at verse 8. Stephen, he was full of faith and Holy Spirit. Here he says, Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of what was called the Freedman Synagogue, composed of both the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians, and some from Scythia and Asia, came forward and disputed with Stephen. But they were unable to stand up against his wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. Now, I know there's some words now that we don't totally understand. But if you look at verse 10, the most important part of that is, is that you see the work of the Holy Spirit in him. You can see how he is being led by the Holy Spirit. Church, he is following Jesus, allowing the Holy Spirit to be his guide. Now, I ask you again, what is leading you? What is leading you? Is it your own ambition? Is it your own your desires? Is it to please yourself? They're allowing the Holy Spirit to lead them. And here we see specifically Stephen is being led by the Holy Spirit. Full of grace and power, performing miracles. The Holy Spirit is doing a great work in his life. And now he comes into conflict. He comes into conflict with these two groups of people and some others from these other two countries. And they come to confront him. Peter is standing on the truth. He's preaching and teaching about Jesus. And they come to stand against him. But they are not able to do so because of his wisdom and the spirit that's in him. The Holy Spirit is leading him. And because the Holy Spirit is leading him, they can do nothing against that. And so this continues on. This continues on. Well, if you keep reading through chapter 6 and through chapter 7, you're going to see that they actually arrest Peter. Or Peter. They actually arrest Stephen. He finds himself in trouble. Doing everything right, he finds himself arrested. Look at verse 51. This is Acts chapter 7, verse 51. It says, 
he's calling these people out and he says, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you were always resisting the Holy Spirit as your ancestors did, so do you. Now this is pretty blunt. This is pretty blunt. He's called them out and he's using not kind words. He's calling them out. But he's calling them out on not following Jesus. He's calling them out about them not following. Now who is it that Stephen is following here? He's following Jesus. He's on the Holy Spirit to lead him and guide him. And I ask you again, what is leading you? What is leading you? He calls them out ugly words. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. He calls them out. It didn't settle well with them. Look at verse 54. When they heard these things, they were enraged to their hearts and they gnashed their teeth at him. I have never been so angry that I wanted to bite someone. But they were. This group, they were so cut, so hurt, so conflicted by what Stephen said, they were enraged. And all he told them basically was the truth. But they didn't want to hear the truth. They were enraged in the hearts and he called them out for not following the Holy Spirit, not following God. Not allowing the Holy Spirit to be the Lord of their life. And instead, what happened? They got angry about it. We don't like to be told we're wrong, do we? We usually get on the defense, don't we? And we'll lash back out. And sometimes we'll lash back out before we even remember or even think about what we're saying. We can lash out. That's what we see here. They lashed out. Instead, they took it very personal and they lashed out. So they gnashed their teeth at him. But verse 55, look at Stephen here. But Stephen filled with the Holy Spirit. So here they are. They're gnashing at him and running upon him and, man, biting him. If you've ever been bit by a kid, I've never been bit by an adult, but being bit by a kid does not feel pleasant. So I'd imagine being bit by an adult would be really weird, but hurt too. So as this is happening to him, being filled by the Holy Spirit, again, he's still following Jesus, being filled by the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw God's glory with Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Do you see his actions here? Can you see the attitude of his heart? Can you see the work of the Holy Spirit in him? Here is trouble that has found him, but instead he's following Jesus, and church, he is at complete peace. They're gnashing at him, and he's gazing up in the heavens. Oh, look, I see Jesus. As they are gnawing at him, acting like animals, and he's in a completely different world. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has filled him up. He's following the Holy Spirit. And even though this trouble has come, he doesn't focus on the trouble. What does he focus on? Oh, I see Jesus. At the right hand of God. I see Jesus. Church, could you imagine when trouble finds you? Instead of focusing on your trouble. Looking to the one you're following. And he didn't just look church he gazed if you've ever seen somebody gaze it's really awkward because they're in another world and you can see so clearly he's gazing he looked up in the heavens and they're doing all this to him him being filled with the holy spirit he's just gazing looking at the one he's following while all this trouble is coming 
He's being led by the Holy Spirit. Church, I ask you again, what is leading you? Because look what happens here. So here he is. He's looking up and he sees the Son of Man at the right hand of God. Look at verse 57. And he's saying this audibly. So they screamed at the top of the voices and covered their ears together. And together they rushed against him. They threw him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. That's very important too. We're going to talk about that next week. Have you ever not wanted to hear something? What do you typically do when you don't want to hear something? It's typically what we do. We'll cover our ears and we'll... But they screamed. They didn't want to hear it. Again, again, Steve is not doing anything wrong, is he? He's telling people about Jesus. He told them that they needed to start following the Holy Spirit. They're falling to the same trap that their ancestors did. He's not doing anything wrong. Yet trouble found him. And instead of focusing on the trouble, oh, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And while he's gazing, they covered their ears, screamed really loud, and they led him outside of the city and they started hurling rocks at him hurling rocks now I don't know if you've ever been hit by a rock but it really hurts verse 59 they were stoning Stephen as he called out Lord Jesus receive my spirit and then he knelt down and he cried out with a loud voice. Lord, do not charge him with this sin. And saying this, he fell asleep. What do we do when people are against us? We don't act this way, do we? Usually we say, okay, God, get them. Or we'll lash back out. Did you see the way he died? He, he fell asleep. In this previous, this previous example that we learned about, how did they die? They dropped what? They dropped dead. Not Stephen. He died peacefully. So as much as he fell asleep. In the church, you will see two different examples. What's the difference? One's being led by the Holy Spirit. One is not. One is following Jesus through all areas of their life. The other was a part of the community of God. They were a part of the church. But they were following themselves. Where are we at in our decision making? I don't know about you. I'm not ready to die just yet. But when it does happen, I don't necessarily want to drop dead as Ananias and Sapphira did here. I don't necessarily want to be stoned either. But when I see that he fell asleep, after praying for the very people that were killing him, church, this is an example to us. He didn't drop dead. Being led by the Holy Spirit, it led to his death. Following Jesus led to his death, but the difference was, was how it ended. Not only was he being led by the Holy Spirit, church, he died peacefully. He fell asleep. He fell asleep. Church, do you see the difference in these two examples? Can, can you see the difference? One is peaceful, the other is not. 
One is brought upon him by the lies and deceit and greed. And the other is so peaceful being led by the Holy Spirit even though it was more painful. See, the other ones, all they did was get confronted with the lie. Peter, did you do this? Yeah, this is what we sold it for. Drop, dead. They felt no pain. There was no stoning, no nothing. Stephen, on the other hand, was doing everything right. Preaching, teaching, he didn't tell a lie. He was doing everything right, yet trouble found him. And even as he was being bid on, as he was being stoned, he was fixed on Jesus. Oh, look. I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What do we focus on when trouble finds us? Or are we too quick to blame someone? Quick to look to see who else we can blame. Who else's fault it is besides ours? In church, we often do this. We often do this. The question this morning to you is, who are you following? Are you following yourself? Or are you following Jesus? Who do you blame for the experiences that you face? Are you blaming someone else or are you accepting responsibility for your actions? Do you see the difference in this? Because there's just such a difference. We cannot make bad choices and blame God. But we can accept the responsibility for our actions. Church, maybe there's something even in your past that you've been blaming God for. God, why did we go through this? God, why this? This morning, is there something that you need to accept responsibility for? See, I'm not so sure that this isn't how we're supposed to approach God to begin with. Say, God, you know what? I'm, expect I'm accepting responsibility for my past. I've sinned. I have messed up. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my past. Forgive me for my faults, my shortcomings, and my failures. Now help me live the rest of my days and my life for you. I'm going to follow you like Stephen. And whenever I make bad choices, I'm going to accept the responsibility. But I understand that life experiences, good or bad, are going to find me regardless. But I want to follow you. Church, who do you find yourself following this morning? Are you following him? Or are you following you? Who are you following? Is there something in your life that you've been blaming somebody else or even blaming God over? Maybe this morning you need to accept some responsibility. Even if it's something that happened so many years ago. Accept responsibility for something that you did. Accept responsibility for a choice that you made. Instead of blaming somebody else, accepting responsibility. We saw what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. They didn't accept responsibility. And ultimately, it led to their death. Church, could you imagine what would happen if we all lived like Stephen? If we all followed God to that point, that even when people are, are against us, even when physical harm finds us, we're just gazing at the one we're following. Who do you gaze at when trouble finds you? Church, we need to look to the one who forgives sin. The one who made a way for us to be at peace with God. And that's Jesus. And as we conclude to this series, follow me. We want to ask you point blank in your life. Who are you following? Who are you following? Church, it's time for us to follow him. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for this account that we read about of Stephen. Father, we don't always handle experiences. We don't always handle them the right way. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you just move through this place right now. That you'd reveal yourself unto us. And how we need to respond to your word. Holy Spirit, speak now. For us, your servants, we are listening. 
you continue to pray? Tristan's message this morning was very simple. Who are you following? Who are you following? Because he wants us to follow him. Not like Ananias and Sapphira, but like Stephen. Follow him even when trouble comes. Pray for others even when they're doing us wrong. To show love and compassion even when things are not going in our favor. Who are you following this morning? This morning I'm not asking anybody to raise your hands. I just want to give you the opportunity to call out to the one. To take a moment to gaze to him. Even right now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. To look to the one. Whom we are to follow. This morning who are you following? Would you make that declaration this morning? Like, you know what, Jesus, I've not always followed you, but this morning I make that declaration that I, I want to follow you. I'm going to follow you like Stephen. I want to follow you. Right now, would you just call to God right now? Just call out to him right now and, and just talk to him. Tell him that just as we're talking right now. Tell him that. I want to follow you. I want to follow you like Ananias and Sapphira. I don't want to blame others. I want to accept responsibility. I want to follow like Stephen. I'm going to follow like Stephen. I just want to give you an opportunity right now to talk to him. Maybe there's something in your past, something in your life that you have not accepted responsibility for. You can do that now. Accept responsibility for that now. For that, that past experience, for whatever those life choices were. Right now, just accept responsibility for it and say, hey, you know what, God? I messed up back here. I need you. God, I messed up back here. I, I need you. I need you to lead me, not Stephen. I know the road's not always going to be easy. But I want to follow you. And when trouble comes, I'm going to continue to gaze to you. I'm going to continue to follow you instead of blaming others. I just want to give you an opportunity to talk to the Lord. If your heart is heavy, if you're a burden this morning, this altar is open for you to come and lay your burdens down. Whatever that looks like. just want to give you an opportunity to talk to the Father about whatever it is upon your heart. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for Jesus. To see the actions of Stephen when people were bringing him harm and he prayed for them. God, it sets an example for us of how we should allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. So God, I pray that you would just fill us up, God, with your Holy Spirit. God, your powerful presence. That we may be able to leave here today with that full of our hearts, just full of the Holy Spirit, full of that grace and truth and power. Not because of who we are, but who we're following, and that is Jesus. Father, I pray for everyone that's here. God, that you would touch them. God, that you would just fill us all up. Oh God, with your glory. That not only we'd be a light unto others, but God, that we would be at peace with you. And when trouble finds us, God, that we won't be so quick to blame you. God, we won't be so quick to blame others. But God, that just we might find ourselves at peace with you. And be able to extend forgiveness unto others. Father, I uplift every couple here. God, that you would just help them in their marriage. Find them so close together, Father. That they would be the best of friends. And that with you at the center of their lives, that there's nothing they can't overcome. Father, I pray for every parent.
God, that you would richly bless them and help them as they raise up their children. And even after their kids get older, past 18, God, you'd help them through those transitions to begin to be that rock for their kids. God, I pray for all these kids here today. God, that you would God, richly bless them in their learning. Help them follow in their education. I know that here we are, we're coming up on summer. May you bless these families to where they can just grow closer to you and one another. Father, we pray for our church. God, that you'd lead us and guide us. God, that we might be a city set on a hill, that we might be a beacon for all others to look at. And God, I pray more than anything that when people see us, they don't see our past, they don't see our mistakes. God, may they see Jesus in us. Thank you again, Father, for your word today. And we take it with us, Father, as we leave here. May we continue to be full of faith, grace, and power, not because of who we are, but because the Holy Spirit lives in us. Now may we be that example, Father, and to others, just as Stephen was. And when experiences hit, when trouble hits, may we continue to gaze to the one we are following, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you take a moment to give God some praise?